Welcome to Inside Fashion. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our special guest today is a name familiar to all of us. It can be seen on labels all across the country, Casper. Casper's designs redefine our idea of comfort and luxury. His clothes are in tune with those women who have a keen eye for enduring design. Design that pays attention to detail and to one's budget. Classic clothes at affordable prices. A very warm welcome to you, Casper. Thank you. Actually, there's something that I've always wanted to ask you. Is Casper your first name or your last name? No, actually, Casper is my last name. It's Herbert Casper. Lord & Taylor has decided they would like to promote me as they, one of their young American designers, and they came up with the idea of Casper. So that's the way it's been, and Casper ever since. What is your study of advertising good preparation for your career as a fashion designer? That's a hard question. I would say that it's removed yet in a sense related, but the point is to use your knowledge of what's happening in the world and then zero into what fits your talent and your taste and where you have a market. Right after college, you served with the occupation forces in Germany. Mm -hmm. Kind of assignment as a business major from New York University, get with the army in Germany. Well, first of all, you have to understand I wasn't really a business major. I was marking time in a sense. I think ever since I was about 10 years old, I wanted to be a designer. And not that I was that aggressive about pursuing it, but in my mind, it was something I thought I would always be. Now, as far as my experience in the Army, I started out being, <laughs> again, completely removed, a company clerk in the Medical Corps, and which had nothing to do with it. But after that, I was transferred to Special Service, which was in Schweinfurt, Germany. And in Schweinfurt was one of the largest opera houses in all of Europe. And you, the USO and special services and all forces that had to do with that kind of work used the opera house. And while I was there, they had these jackets. And what happened was they washed it and they shrunk. And they were jackets for the, uh, the band in one of the shows. So I, in my naive way, came up and I said, well, why don't you just cut them and make little mess jackets out of it? I then started designing costumes for soldier shows, and I did one show, and it was a tremendous experience because it was really more guts on my part than talent. After your experience in the Army, you returned to New York and entered the Parsons School of Design. Right. Soon after that, you had the good fortune, I guess, to become someone's protege. And at that time, the person was a milliner. Who was he, and how did that relationship come about? Well, it's a funny story, too, I suppose. I met John Fredericks, who was a partner of Mr. Fred, and it was the two of them that began somewhere in the early 30s, I think, during the Depression, actually, and it was called John Fredericks. John for Mr. John, and Fredericks for Fred Fredericks. When I met him, I was at Parsons. I was in my second year at Parsons, and during the course of a year, you have two projects, and then at the end of the, the semester or the year, they have a fashion judging contest, and those clothes are put into the lineup. And they have a show, and a jury selects the clothes that they would like to see in the fashion show for that year. And I had both of them selected. And one of them was a fabulous cape, actually. It was all cut on the bias, and it had, it almost looked like a cocoon, actually. And it was quite wonderful, and it was the one that Fred Fredericks bought. But I didn't know he bought it because he sent his designer to buy it because he was afraid that I might want too much money, not knowing how excited I'd have him to buy it to begin with, as most kids are, just the sense of having somebody you know, respect or uh, respond to your work. 
And about a week later, I had this call, would I like to come and see him? And that he had bought the coat. And of course, I went down to see him. And he said that he thought I had a lot of talent and he would like to hire me to work for him. And I said, no, I was going to Paris. But he gave me letters and said, send me sketches. And about six months later, Fred came to Paris and we went around and he went looking in shops and different things, buying fabrics and ribbons and so forth. And I went with him and then he said, please to send him sketches. And I said, I would. And, and then he went home again and I didn't do it. And about two months later, I had the most horrible letter I ever, ever had from anyone. And it frightened me so because he said, you're an idiot, you're selfish, you're lazy. I mean, everything that's negative that could be said. And he said, on top of it, you're, you're blowing it because you're losing the contact of somebody who can be very helpful for you. And I thought, I'd better do something. So what did you do? I bought a magazine called Chapeau. And in it is a magazine that was devoted solely to hats. And I started tracing faces and heads and hats, and I started to get the hang of it. And why I never did that, I suppose I was just frightened into it. And I started a sketch, and then I just didn't stop, because I had done a great deal of research. I mean, I would go to museums in, in Paris, and I'd look at wonderful paintings and see shapes of hats, and it was very inspiring. And I'd go to the library, so I, you know, I had lots of ideas. I just couldn't put it on paper. And then I started sketching, and it was like a well that just ran over. I mean, I used to send him 60 to 100 sketches a week, and he was very, very excited about it, and he loved what I sent him. What did he do with all your sketches? Well, he used some of them, I suppose, because one of the things I did became really quite a fad in fashion, really, in hats. This is like 1947? No, it was really 1949. And I did a hat, or a crown out of mesh, out of net, and then used the horse hair, so they got that wonderful shimmering shadow that horse hair has around here. It was quite beautiful. As a matter of fact, it was very sexy. And then I stopped playing with it and draping it up and putting jewels in the middle of it, and it became, the, or it was really the beginning of all the nose veils that women wore in the early 50s. Who would you say are the most legendary figures in fashion? Well, absolutely, Chanel. There's a picture of Chanel, as a matter of fact, wearing a sweater, I think, and a sailor hat to the side. It was probably done about 1936 or 8, with all the pearls and the jewels that she wore. And I think that she's sitting down, I'm not sure, but a pair of what looks like wide-legged trousers. And I think just the whole classic quality of it and the sense of quality is certainly, for me, inspirational, always will be. Uh, I think Norman Norell, because I grew up in that time, in the sense I was, you know, when his career was finishing off, it was the beginning of my career, but he was certainly a classic, or a classicist, and had great taste. Uh, Mambouche was wonderful. Uh, he had a sense of detail that was fabulous, a dressmaker. Um, Balenciaga was a dressmaker in the sense of the purity of his clothes, which was more like Norman Norell's clothes. And to the work of which of these designers do you think your work most responds? I would like to think it's closest, uh, closer to uh, Chanel. Um, another incredible designer is Claire McCardle. Again, she had, had there was a, an originality about the way she used fabrics and also her sense of simplicity. Was she the first person who really introduced American sportswear? Well, she's, that's, as I, as I know about it, as I read about it, as a, let's say, historian, I would say that she's uh, given that uh, recognition as being one of the first American designers of sportswear. Also, first American designers of recognition. You mentioned earlier Lord & Taylor, that you came to Lord & Taylor. I wonder if that store or any other and their policies were particularly important in vaunting American fashion. Because American fashion, as I see it, was in pretty much the same boat as American art until post-World War II. Really not much thought of. Mm -hmm. I would say that's absolutely true. I would say that Lord and Taylor made or had a reputation of 
fostering the American designer. As a matter of fact, Dorothy Shaver, who was then president of Lord & Taylor, was probably responsible for that. Until the 60s, I would say, a store like Saks Fifth Avenue never rarely promoted a designer unless that designer was confined to them because their sense of merchandising was that they wanted their own clothes. They wanted Saks Fifth Avenue's name to be presented, not the designers. I guess that was in the pre designer label right, era. Right, right, too. because I don't think the label era the store really was became more important exactly, than the and designer. And I don't think the label really became important until the 60s. And what caused that change? The post war art world, designer world. I think that as one designer had a success or recognition and another one, it was just a growing trend and a natural evolution of that. I guess before that, most American fashion houses were known by the names of their manufacturers that is true too. rather than, the, than their designers. Some designers have their label totally of their name alone, and some have the name plus the company. But it's always the designer that's promoted. If we were to pursue that analogy of art and fashion, would it be accurate to say, or merely chauvinistic, that American fashion now is preeminent in the world? Oh, I, I think so. Many people who travel from, let's say, France and come to America love American clothes and buy it. Look what's happened to the jeans. I mean, the sense of where it's, it's universal. I think... Is there any other contribution we've made to fashion other than jeans? Well, I, I, would, I would say... Native American dress? I would say one big contribution is sportswear. Sportswear started here in America, dressing in pieces and parts. Fashion, the inside story, will return in a moment. Turn to fashion, the inside story. For many first-rate designers, paintings and ballet and art exhibitions, films and travel are all part of the raw materials of a great designer. From which of these arts do you especially draw some inspiration? Uh, probably art in itself would be the major contribution. I mean, for example, in about 1970, I was in Paris and I saw this incredible show of Matisse. And it was all the bright colors that I'd seen dozens of times, maybe hundreds of times. And for some reason, it just clicked in my brain and I responded to it. And I did a collection around Matisse and Prince, and it was fabulous. I did it on organza, on some crepe de chine, cottons, and the colors. And the, it was the whole, you know, the, just the whole melange of the influence of that collection. In addition to Matisse, is there the work of a particular artist to which you especially respond? At the moment, Leger. And what because has Leger done for you lately? It's what he may do. No, but I think we're, uh, the many things that I'm being influenced at the moment are in the period of the Art Deco. And I think that something will evolve out of that. You began your design career in the early 1950s based on what you called, I think, a collection premise. What did you have in mind? One of my great trials and tribulations of the, in my career is the fact that I never had any apprenticeship. That I was, when I went and had this job that I told you about, I was given one sample hand, which is someone who sews, and she had one machine, and she cut and made the clothes, sewed them, and I gave her the sketches. And I really followed step by step and learned on my own. Now, I did this for a few months, and the world didn't fall apart. But then I did a spring collection, which was my first collection, and I made about 50 designs. I just made what I liked, and it was a phenomenal overnight success. I mean, it was brilliant as far as the audience looked. And my problem was how to go on to the next collection. And now that I was a full-fledged designer that was successful, I didn't know what to do because I didn't know how to begin the collection. I became 
frightened by my own success and not really knowing how to begin because so I, what did you do? I stumbled through it, I suppose, and I luckily knock wood. I uh, I stumbled through it well, but it was it was a learning process for me where I've always felt I've gone to schools and talked to students and I've said you know one of the most important things is to have a learning period of it, because from that you can grow. One thing that I did learn, and it probably always stayed with me, is the fact that when women bought clothes at the couture, and I used to go to the, all the shows and I'd watch and listen, they almost went to spend thousands of dollars in the same way someone, a, a housekeeper, wife might go out and buy an A&P. She had a marketing list. She would say, well, I'm spending three months in Paris and I'm going to Saint Moritz for Christmas. She bought clothes that fit into her schedule for the year. And one of the things I did is I would design a coat. And with that coat, I would design a skirt and a blouse, maybe. And then I might design an, a dress that went with it. And then sometimes I would do an evening dress or a short evening dress that would go with that same coat, either in the sense of colors, textures, or fabrics. So that what I tried to do is my, in my own way was present a capsule wardrobe within the collection. And in a sense, that is the premise of sports of buying pieces that work together. Now, for example, you're wearing that jacket. That jacket could be worn over a slim black silk dress. It could be worn with a print of the skirt of its own. You could wear it if you wanted to with a full chiffon skirt. You could wear it with a long dinner skirt or a pair of evening pants or even a pair of wool pants. So that the concept of it is the same. And that is one of the premises that I base my thinking and my collection on. And it's something I did learn in Paris. You said that you believe that clothes should not wear the woman, but she should wear the clothes. What do you mean when you say that? I think that clothes really have to become part of the woman, her wardrobe, her life, her style. I think that once you're aware of what you're wearing, you no longer become yourself. And I think that clothes have to have the ease, the flexibility, and this again is much more of an American concept. If I could buy just one thing for my wardrobe this year, what should it be? I would say that if you were buying one thing, I would buy either a slim skirt with some sort of side opening or front opening to show leg, or I would buy a easy sweater you know, drop shoulder, something like a crew neck, but something that is a sweater blouse. But I would say the skirt would be the focal point. Because Any particular color? No, I would say black, because black is something you might wear in the day, and you also could wear it in the evening. And I would buy a longer length. How do you recommend that someone really best take care of their clothes? Well, obviously, if it's a bag or shoes, I think to have some kind of cream or polish to keep the leather well lubricated. I think certainly not to throw a bag on, but if you're really being guarded, but I think anybody, regardless of what you have, if you really care about your clothes, I think it's to take a bag and put it in a sack at night when it's in a, in a drawer, not just fling it over someplace and have it scratch and get worn out. When a woman enters a department store and is confronted with racks and racks of clothes and hundreds of choices, what do you think determines what she's going to select? I think that women, one, respond to color. And I mean, if you see racks of clothes, you're going to respond to something that comes out at you. And if, if everything on the rack is black or gray or blue and there's some color that intrigues you, you'll, you'll reach out for it. I think the next thing is when you reach out for it and you hold it up, you're touching it, you feel it. And I think if, if the feel and the touch is pleasant, you respond to it. Then the next thing is you actually look at it. And if you like the style, you put it on. Now, I would put price last because if you really love it, unless it's totally out of your range, I've always said that one has, has to have a love affair with a dress or a coat or a blouse or whatever it's it be. asking for a lot. No, in a way, it, you have to because I think what clothes do for the woman and the man is they give them an emotional release in the sense of when you put something on and you feel good, you feel different about everything, about yourself and your being and where you are. And I think clothes do that for you. And how much of it depends upon advertising and promotion? A lot, a lot. People will come in and ask for that particular thing that's been advertised.
I mean, just the stores, why do stores run full-page ads of fashion? Because it brings people into the store. So obviously advertising is tremendously important. I know you're very much interested in classic design. You made reference before to something, to fads. What is the difference in the end between fads and fashion? Well, fad, fad is something that's really very short-lived. It might just last for a, a few months or a season. Uh, fashion is, again, like a good idea or, or thinking. It's an evolution. How has your own style of dressing changed over the years? Did you ever put your, always put yourself together so carefully and so colorfully? It's what we call calculated casualness. <laughs> Uh, well, it works. You know, I would say so. Are you less formal today than you were in the oh, past? <clears throat> much, much. I think the world we live in is much uh, less formal. And I would say the way I dress, I mean, I go to work in a turtleneck sweater and I go sometimes jeans or sometimes, you know, you know a sport jacket and trousers but, uh, or a suit. But I would say that when I first started, I always wore a suit and a shirt and a tie, but uh, much less formal. How do you define glamour? Glamour is an illusion. Glamour is something that's really an emotion. It's a, it's a feeling. And that's really what, what fashion is all about. Mystery. I think that is certainly part of it. One can be sensuous at night, or one can be a sensuous human being in this, her particular style. Uh, one might be just very casual and, and more clean cut and simple, and yet glamorous. I mean, certainly, if you, would you say that Katharine Hepburn is a glamorous woman? I certainly think someone like Carol Lombard was glamorous. You go back to the, the sirens of uh, Jean Harlow or Marilyn Monroe, they were glamorous to people. Who do you see as your audience and what do they want to wear? I like to think of my audience as being certainly a, an educated one who has not only the, the, the schooling but also the, the education, the sense of just traveling and doing things. And she's a woman who has, let's say, gone to college, may have worked, may, may still be working. Uh, she's a woman who's interested in lots of things. By the way, how do you feed your ego in this design process? How do I feed my ego? By being successful. You know, a designer shows a collection about five times a year. And each time you do that, like show business, you put your head on the block. And it's very difficult. So when you said feed your ego, I mean obviously applause, pat on the back is what feeds one's ego. And sales. And sales, absolutely. So that, like show business, it's very difficult because, I, you know, each time you begin a collection, it's almost, yes, you have a reputation and you are successful and people do expect something from you, but it's like starting all over again. Because what happened last year, or last season, success was really short-lived. And the new success of failure is going to live with what you're doing now. If each season is like beginning all over again. How do you sustain yourself? By that very thing. Because it's the excitement that is created each time. And that's why I always consider myself not only that fact of being lucky because I am talented and have made it work, but to be in a business as interesting as it is, I mean, at times I absolutely hate it, but where you can turn yourself on so many times a year by just looking at new colors and new fabrics and new ideas, and it's a sense of keeping yourself bubbling and thinking and going all the time. If you had it to do over again, what would you do otherwise? I think probably the only thing I really would have liked to have been, and I think still would be a psychiatrist. But that's not so far-fetched. I'm involved with people. I mean, being a designer in some ways you are. You're giving something to that person. Uh, but I am interested in people, and, I would, and I'm very much interested in, in psychiatry, psychology, and the mind. Did you ever expect your life to unfold the way it has? Well, I said when I was 10 years old, I wanted to be a fashion designer. Well, you're a lucky fellow, and we're lucky that your fantasy has become our reality. And thank you, Casper, for being so generous and sharing your thoughts and your ideas with us. <laughs>